I am Lucia Civilotti and I'm going to tell you today how the work of my lab over several years using single channel recording has obtained an activation mechanism that describes the activation of the glycine receptor. The glycine channel is a member of the pentameric ligand gated ion channel superfamily and is related to muscle nicotinics. Glycine receptors can be homomeric and have all the five subunits the same, or it can be heteromeric as it is a synapsis. In the simplest general activation mechanism that I show here, even the simple mechanism is actually quite complex. It contains six shut states. You can see the receptor unbound binds one agonist molecule, and then it can open with a low probability, and then it binds another agonist molecule, and so on and so forth. So you can have six shut states and five open states. So there are 20 rate constants and 10 equilibrium constants. So what does that tell us about what we should find in things such as macroscopic currents? Well, macroscopic currents from an activation mechanism such as this should contain the number of states minus one, that is 11 minus one, 10 components. These 10 components will have 10 time constants and 10 areas of the components, and those will be a function of the whole of the Q matrix. So it will be a function of the whole of the mechanism. Now, those of you who are electrophysiologists may have uh, fitted, I don't know, synaptic currents, for instance, and may have fitted exponentials. And I have never fitted more than two components. It's very difficult to. So 10 components. So macroscopic currents are not very likely to be informative. This slide shows you the concentration dependent of single channel activity for glycine receptors. Here they are heteromers. This is very strong and is one of the positive qualities, properties that make these channels such a joy to work with with single channel recording. At low agonist concentration, we have openings that are brief in either alone or in groups that we call bursts. And these are separated by long shut times that are the expression of the binding behavior of the channel. The channel cannot really open when it is unbound. So when the channel shuts and dissociates, it then cannot reopen until agonist rebinds. So the shut time here is concentration dependent. And you can see that as I increase the concentration, these groups of openings, these bursts, become more closely spaced, become much closer. So you can see that these shut times become shorter. Note that we don't know whether this channel that operates here and this channel that operates here are the same channel molecule. So these long shut times that are the expression of binding and unbinding are affected by the number of channels in the patch. And we don't know what that is in this case. But as we go up in concentration, you can see that as these bursts cluster into what we call clusters, separated by long desensitized states, it becomes more easy to tell when the channel activity comes from one single ion channel molecule. Because otherwise, we would see doubles double openings. And this is even more clear when we are at very high concentration. You can see that high concentration, the channel is either shut and desensitized or is mostly open with glycine. And it's got very brief shut-ins. At these very high concentrations, because the channel is either desensitized or mostly open, we can measure the maximum open probability of the channel here, and we can obtain from it 
for a nicely behaved channel such as glycine, the glycine receptor, we can obtain the efficacy equilibrium constant E. This is um, related to the maximum P open by this equation, equation, and this is valid for most mechanisms, the limit of the max of the open probability at high concentrations of glycine. So this is a direct estimate that we can get when we know P open max, but the fact that the shape of the equation is like this, and you should familiarize with it yourselves with it by doing a few numerical examples, you will see that while we can get a decent estimate of E, when E is above 10 in numerical value, well, we can't really discriminate between agonists. So you, you could have an agonist that has an efficacy of 10, and 10 over 11 is not that different from, say, an agonist that has an efficacy of 20. 20 over 21 is not that different from, from 10 over 11. This is already quite an achievement, and remember that there is no other way to measure quite simply efficacy with macroscopic techniques. In order to make the most of the data in single channel recordings, we must, however, start looking at the dwell times of the channel in the various states, in the open and shut states, and display what we call the distribution of events. So David Cahoon has already told you today how the lifetime of a channel, shut state or open state, doesn't matter, has an exponential shape. And this is a probability density function that we expect. So if we plot the, the number of or the frequency of events versus how long these events are, we should have an exponential like this, and tau, the time constant, is here. We have a time constant that we have posed to be 1. And it's got the exponential decay shape. Now, this is not particularly convenient, because by eye, you cannot really determine where tau is. But what we normally do is use a transformed version of these. So instead of using linear and linear axes, what we do is plot the distribution of the logarithm of the dwell times. And we can then display them like this against this frequency, or we can display them against the square root. And that has got nice properties in terms of error distribution. The beauty of this is that you can see we have turned this decay, decaying curve into a peaky curve that has a peak at the time constant. So you can actually sort of analyze by eye almost. This slide shows you the data that I was showing earlier for glycine receptor cell attached recording at 10 micromolar, 30 micromolar, and 1,000 micromolar glycine. And these events are here plotted as open time distributions and shut time distribution. As I was saying earlier, we use a transform log scale here. So this is the distribution of log dwell times that allows us to see the time constant as the peak of the probability density function. Now, good things about ion chan single channel recording we can already see in the shut times particularly that there are several components and we can count more than two components. So that beats macroscopic. We can see that the longer shut times here are concentration dependent. You can see how the peak moves to the left here. However, this is not completely perfect and straightforward. How many components should I fit? Look at here. Is it one component? Is it two components? This is a really fat curve if you look at this one. And what about the shut times here? So it's often unclear how many shut or open times I should fit. Also, there is little 
information about desensitized states. And in fact, our mechanisms will not contain desensitized states. They are pure activation mechanisms. Desensitized shuttings are long. And so we find very few. You can just about see a little burble here of desensitized states. And, you know, we don't get nice peaky distributions here because in a good patch of 10 minutes recording, you won't measure that many desensitized dwell times. Other problems are to do with interpretation of these data in terms of mechanisms. Yes, we can say, well, the time constant here is about what, 200 milliseconds for this shut state. What does that mean in terms of mechanism? The time constants of the distributions are not generally, except in rare cases, the reciprocal of the rate constants of the Q matrix, period. This is basically because many of the states are compound states because that have multiple entry and exit, roughly speaking. It's also difficult to know how to connect the states. An example of this was provided by David, who discussed a paper by Charles Stevens, in which Stevens was attempting to find where desensitized states come from, whether from the open or the shut states. It's not easy, it's very tricky. Last but not least is the missed events problem. And the exact correction has been worked out by Cahoon by Jalali, Cahoon and Hawkes, but it's not straightforward because it needs a mechanism. More about this later. This slide shows what I mean by missed events. So th this is a trace at low concentration of glycine. We have short openings and you can see if an opening is quite short, it's going to be filtered and it's going to become smaller than its full open amplitude that we see for longer openings. So do I classify this as an opening? What about this? If I don't classify this as an opening, then what happens is that the shut times at each side of this opening just merge together. And so the shut time distribution is distorted. The same thing happens the opposite thing happens when we have a lot of open time and we ha have brief shuttings, like at high concentration here. Is this a real shutting? If I class it to be a real shutting, well, fine. But if I decide that this is noise, then, and this is really a, a real shutting, well, these two open states are going to be merged together, erroneously. Now, there is a solution to this problem because there is the exact correction for missed events. But in order to apply this, we must know the mechanism. Now you will say, wait a minute, this is catch 22. We're trying to discover the mechanism. We don't have the mechanism yet. So how do we solve this? Well, the way we solve this is that we assume a mechanism. We just write a mechanism that is possible on the basis of the structure of the receptor, the number of likely binding sites, and we put in a set of rate constant values that are physically possible. Then using this, we calculate the likelihood, that is a posh way of saying probability for this, the probability that such a mechanism and rate constants would produce our data. Then the computer grinds and it adjusts the rate constant values until it maximizes its probability. And that is the best fit of this mechanism. However, remember, we assume the mechanism, and so we don't know that this mechanism is right. We must now check whether this mechanism we've tested is sufficient to describe all our data. If not, we must change the mechanism and try again. This slide shows you what we mean by calculating the likelihood of our data. So imagine you have a sequence with 
one opening, one shutting, and a second opening. And these have particular dwell times. Okay? So the likelihood of this sequence is a probability that the channel opens for the first opening for 2 milliseconds times the probability that it then shuts for 10 milliseconds and it has been open 2 milliseconds times the probability that we have an opening now of 5 milliseconds and that the channel has been shut for 10 milliseconds and open 2 milliseconds. This is calculated with matrix mechanism, with matrix methods, including the resolution of the observations, and so an exact missed event correction can be applied. So we do this and we adjust the values of the right constants until we get the best fit of the mechanism. And we do this simultaneously to set of recordings. In this case, this is a ligand gated ion channel, so we use different agonist concentrations. Uh, we use pretty large data sets with typically, I don't know, about 10,000 openings in each set, in, e at, in each concentration, and four recordings at four different concentrations, a sample from very low concentration to saturating concentration of mechanism. So what we've got to do now, having fitted directly to the sequences of data the mechanism, we have to look and see whether the mechanism describes our distributions, which are the way we can display these sequences in, an, in a visible way for the human eye. So let's look at the distributions now. The first thing that I'm going to show you is what happens when a mechanism isn't right. So I have done my best fit directly to the sequence of events, and now I display shut time distributions at various concentrations and open time distributions at various concentrations. Here I'm showing just one concentration. Now you have to compare the real data, and those are the jagged lines here, the histogram, with the curve, which is what the mechanism predicts. Well, the open times are not bad. The residuals, so the discrepancy, is highlighted in red. For shut times, however, this is not good at all. You can see there is a huge discrepancy in between what the mechanism predicts and what the sh shut times look like. So what is wrong here? We have a mechanism, the mechanism that I have tried here is a mechanism that has five binding sites and that has five open states, but it forces all the bindings to be the same. So it doesn't matter whether the receptor is empty and you're the first glycine to bind, or you're the second, or you're the fifth glycine to bind. The binding is the same. But you can see this doesn't work. So the minimum number of shut states and a constant binding doesn't work for the glycine receptor. Now, it was actually OK for the nicotinic receptor. Binding was constant. But with glycine receptors, when one site is occupied, the next binding appears to have higher affinity. And we need more shut states. So forget about this mechanism. This is what a good fit looks like. We have the open times at four different concentrations, and we have the shut times at different concentrations. And you will see that the part that we are interested in is actually much better than we had before. Something that I wanted to show you particularly here is the importance of best events. Now, I told you that the curves show you the predicted distribution of open times given the resolution that we had. The red dashed lines here, the red dashed curves, are what we would have seen if we did not miss events, if we did not miss a lot of short shuttings like we see here. So with perfect resolution, you can see that the openings are very different from the openings that we see. So this shows you that the lengthening of the openings that we have 
as we go up in concentration is due to us missing more and more shut times. And it also shows that if we didn't have missed event corrections, we could not have brought this project to a good ending because this mattered a lot. Another check for our mechanism, for our successful mechanism against data. So we have obtained our mechanism and its rate from steady state equilibrium single channel recordings. But these predict also synaptic currents or macroscopic currents, concentration jumps in non-equilibrium conditions. Remember at the synapse, we have a sudden increase to millimolar concentrations of glycine and a fast decay of this concentration. So it's not an equilibrium situation. So this shows you how glycinergic iPSCs, their decay is not well predicted by our bad mechanisms. And we'll talk about later what the good mechanism contains. But this is what the good mechanism contains. And this is a mechanism with three binding sites and a conformational change before gatings. So I have shown you what good mechanisms do in predicting the distribution of shut times, open times, correlations, the decay of macroscopic currents. It also predicts the dose response curve. What remains to discuss is what is this mechanism and how we constructed it. So now we have to build a mechanism that incorporates these two properties, namely that the binding sites increase in affinity as more and more molecules of glycine become bound, and there are more shut states than the bare minimum of shut states. So first thing, let's have a look. Well, this is the simplest way of doing this. We have the first binding is low affinity, the second binding is higher affinity, and the third binding is higher affinity still. Opening occurs from the bound states, and it's more and more favorable as you become more bound. So the maximum propensity for opening is when the channel, this is a heteromeric channel, this is Burzomato et al. data 2004. So the maximum opening occurs when the channel is bound to three molecules of glycine. What about the extra shut states? Well, the simplest way is just to attach them there. So there is a shut state, an extra shut state for every level of ligation. Now, this is a mechanism that will fit, but why can we do better? This mechanism has very many free parameters. So it's got one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's got nine steps here. So it's got 18 rate constants. Also, the shut states are there you know, attached to the bound states on the other side of the opening. Does that make sense? So there are two things that we've got to reflect on. One is the position of these extra shut states. And the other is how we understand interaction between the binding sites. Now, in order to think a little bit about this interaction, Remember that the binding sites are quite far apart in the receptor. They're across the whole of the extracellular domain. So what we've got to do is to think of hemoglobin. This problem occurred and was tackled for hemoglobin, as we see in the next slide. In hemoglobin, the molecule has got four binding site for oxygen, and it appears to be cooperative. But the interaction between binding sites that is implicit in this cooperativity can be attributed and was attributed by Wyman and Mono Wyman and Changeur to not to talking to the next site one at a time, but to the fact that the protein can exist in two conformations. And in these two conformations, the binding sites are high affinity in one conformation and low affinity in another. So all the binding sites can be 
either in low affinity or in high affinity. So it's a concerted change in the conformation. Hemoglobin is also a multimer. And so the affinity depends on what state you're in. So in the flip mechanism, we do something similar. And let's have a look. So the first layer of shut states, we have binding to the resting state. And because we have said that in this situation, we have that the affinity depends on the on the conformation, the affinity is the same. Then we have another layer of shut states, but this time we're going to put them here on the way to opening. And for completeness, we can also put in a shut state, even though the grayed out states here are the ones that we cannot really measure. So for completeness, we put it in anyway, just to show it. And then we have the open states. So what we have here is the affinity goes up from here to there. And then in the open state, we can't even measure how high the affinity is for the open states, but it's certainly very high. So you can see that this mechanism is somewhat different from the one we've seen before. And why, why do we like it? Well, first of all, it's got fewer free parameters than the Jones and Westbrook mechanism. And the other thing is that it's got the shut states here. Now, the shut states here, the extra shut states, already have higher affinity. But they are on the way to opening. So they are opening intermediates or reopening shut states, prime states, they've been called, we call them flip. But states such as these have been detected in a variety of channels in the nicotinic superfamily, in muscle receptors, in 5-HD3 receptors, in GABA receptors. We ourselves have extended our work to muscle nicotinics and uh, to other sorts of glycine receptors. We have used the FLIP model also to look at the problem of efficacy. You will remember that on glycine receptors, glycine is a full agonist, so glycine channels are either desensitized or open all the time, whereas taurine is a partial agonist, and even a very high concentration, it cannot keep the channel open all the time. So what does it mean to apply the FLIP mechanism to these to this problem of efficacy. Well, in the Del Castillo cats mechanism, we have only one step for opening or gating, this one. In the flip mechanism, well, don't look at all of that. We only need to look at the high bound, the totally bound states. So we have two steps. So we examined what happens with partial agonists when we fit their data with the flip mechanism. Now, with glycine, let's have a look. So you can imagine we have a resting state. We just look at the totally bound, three bound states here, three molecules of glycine flipped and open. With glycine, what happens is that the channel lingers very little in the resting state but progresses very quickly, you see 50 microseconds on average, and it goes into the flip state, into the intermediate, and from there it goes into the open state, it opens. For taurine, there is a difference, but the difference is due to the fact that taurine bound channels linger much longer in this condition here, in this resting condition, it's almost one and a half seconds before it can enter the flip state, the intermediate, and open. So the intermediate state is a sort of gating uh, transition state that gates or determines the efficacy of agonists of the glycine receptor. Now we have seen this happens also in other channels such as muscle nicotinics, and other people 
have applied this to other receptors in the superfamily. So pre-opening intermediates exist. Recently, we have actually seen what intermediates look like for the glycine receptors, thanks to the work of Eric Guo. And the interesting thing about pre-opening intermediates is that they are the determinant for agonist efficacy in these channels. Thank you.